under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build. The National Broadcasting Company presents A Time to Build. In cooperation with the Alfred T. Sloan Foundation, the Public Affairs Department of NBC has these past six months explored what we believe to be one of the most significant developments of our generation, the rebirth of the South. tiny crossroads too small to be registered on any map. We began in the belief that we were recording simply an economic change, an evolutionary thing to be measured in decades. But we were wrong. What we witnessed and what we caught on our recording machines was a revolution in industry, in farming, in economics, and in the whole pattern of life as it lived in the South. We are ready now to report on what we saw and heard. The voices and the sounds you're about to hear are real. We have no actors. The script was written by a hundred hands and underlined by the sound of machines. A witness to all of this and our guide in the weeks to come is Mr. Henry Cassidy, distinguished foreign correspondent and NBC observer at the United Nations. Mr. Cassidy. At the outset... I'm afraid I must admit that I was chosen for this assignment not because of what I knew, but because of what I did not know. In talking to the gentleman who arranged this tour of the South, apparently my most appealing asset was my complete ignorance. Ignorance, I hasten to add, of the South. You see, I'm a New Englander. I was born there, and there I lived until I joined that group of correspondents who work at the crossroads of the world. London, I know, and Paris. I can tell you the best place to eat in Casablanca, and I know how the walls of the Kremlin look when they're red with the setting sun. But there was one place, one huge area, virtually a third of a continent that I did not know, the southern portion of the United States. The mountains and the plains, the cities and the villages, the farmland and the waste that lie below the straggling line of Mason and Dixon, all that I did not know. Of course I thought I did. I'd read some books and heard some music. Listen. There it is. There is the South I thought I knew. Workers loading cotton at New Orleans, tobacco smelling sweet in the hot sun, hovels for some folks and mansions for others, and for the righteous, a mint julep at the end of the road. I was completely, absolutely, irrevocably wrong. While I'd been away reporting the goings on in Europe, a revolution had taken place behind my back. It's always exciting to observe a revolution. What would you give to be taken back to Philadelphia, 1776, and hear the voices that spoke of independence and the rights of man? No such magic is afforded us. But in this age of science, we have a magic of our own, a wizardry compounded of test tubes and chemicals and spinning reels, the tape recorder. I need but touch it, and like some latter-day Aladdin, I summon up whom I will. I remember one evening in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the location, as you know, of the University of North Carolina. I had gone there to seek out one Paul Green, the author of In Abraham's Bosom. Here I knew... I could find a starting out place for my journey, a guide for the unknown places that lay ahead of me. These eyes had looked on much of the South, the old, and the new. Tell me, Mr. Green, I said, please, of the changes you have seen. There is a new culture in the South that goes along with the new economic and industrial era of this part of the country. 
It is a glorious thing that it is true because there are some nations, some sections of the world that may have a tremendous industrial and economic and engineering power and not accompany that with what I would call things of the spirit. We need not smile at the word spirit, but maybe it's a good word. Take the case of Sparta, ancient Sparta. Her citizens were trained to fight. And Sparta gave no culture, no art, no music, no drama, no great epic poetry to the world. But think what Athens did. In the South, we have something of the spirit of Athens working among the people. There's a new and powerful dynamic of beauty in the South. The grace, the decoration, even the fire and inspiration and glory of the people's lives is now being realized in their sense and in their urge to cultural value. We've had the privilege, this NBC documentary unit, of traveling on the road with the North Carolina Symphony Society. Now there, I suppose, you have an example of the flowering of culture in the New South, and I believe you've had something to do with it. Well, I remember when the efforts to sound the symphony were congregating or coming to a fermenting boil. One of the leading educators stood up in the meeting and said that he was against having an orchestra here because the musicians were notoriously lax in their morals. And if we had such a group here at Chapel Hill, uh, this group would contaminate the student body. Well, I got up and tried to make a reply to that, and I said, take a great professional tennis player. They come by here, and we let the boys see them, and it has tremendous effect on the playing power of these boys. Now, if we could get a good orchestra started down here and have good musicians, and the young people who are interested in the violin, in the piano, in the tuba, in the trombone, can come and listen and watch good players at work think what it would do to their improvement in their own chosen art. The other night, no doubt, you heard a folk song out of the mountains of North Carolina. I think the name of it is Johnson's Old Gray Mule, played uh, by the symphony, arranged here. And I heard it the other night in the midst of the legislature of North Carolina and the legislators listened to it, shouted their applause, and one of them on the money committee said, I say let's give Benjamin Swalleen everything he wants. southern town. Right now, as I'm talking, there are 100 or 150 people getting ready to get their supper and go to their typewriters to write books. And when I came here in 1916, the only man in town that had written a book was Dr. Archibald Henderson, and he was a miracle. But as I say, tonight, there must be 150 people in this little town, writing books. There are people here composing music tonight and composing poems, dreaming their dreams out on paper for edification of this soul I talked about. Now we are going back and are trying to beautify our lives. The things of the spirit. I heard that in a hundred different ways in a hundred different places. Not all had Mr. Green's felicity of expression, but whatever the words, the message was the same. Consider, for example, Mr. Ralph Ford. 
Mr. Ford is a grocer in Georgetown, South Carolina. He's known lean times. He can remember days when not a single customer pushed open his screen to announce his needs. Then, a few years ago, the Georgetown Mill opened down the road, and, well, here's how Mr. Ford put it. Well, in this case, the biggest changes I see is in pop in real estate. When we put the mill came here, we were at a lower level, and uh, we were trading amongst ourselves, and uh, we were living, but we were doing more trading with each other than anything else. And then how about now? Well, it's a different proposition now. It's... It's a wide open market. Well, I might put it in these terms, Mr. Ford. How about your own business? How would you compare your own business now to what it was before the mill came here? Well, before the mill came here, I think we employed about six people. Six? Yeah. And how many now? Twenty-six. How about terms of uh, volume of business? Well, we didn't pay much income tax in those days. I tell you now, Bob. Uh, I'm going to give you a favorite expression about the International Paper Company of Southern Craft Corporation. They came to Georgetown, and of course, they're like any other industry, they had their faults. They have a terrific smell, see? Yes, as a matter of fact, they told us about it themselves. And, uh, <laughs> they got around and they asked a few old timers like Dr. Bell and myself, what does it smell like? I said, smell like bacon and eggs to me. traveled across this land. The Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Florida. We saw Texas and learned how courageous men fight back to dust when rain doesn't come. We went to Natchez and talked to one who had gone out from the south and returned. Tennessee, Mississippi. Each turn of the road was a new starting out place and always there were hills beyond the hills. There was one facet of Southern life that I had been warned might be well to leave alone, the social aspect of the revolution, the changes that have taken place in the relationship between, as one Southerner put it, those with white skin and those with brown. But I found that Southern thinkers were perfectly willing to discuss the subject. Like all sincere visitors to the South, I was well aware that there were some things in my own hometown that I would rather see ignored, and I came with neither solution nor recrimination. The ignorant are best prepared to learn. I learned much. I learned from Dr. Mitchell, the guiding light of a little-known organization that typifies the new attitude. Tradition, of course, dies hard, but listen. Until three or four years ago, the newspapers in our good southern states still treated most Negro news with a slight scoff uh, in the attitude and bearing of the 1850s. Uh, Negroes were hardly news, if news, then funny news or crime news. We saw that and thought something ought to be done about it. Sent out to various of our friends and said, look, save us all the clippings out of your local paper on this thing. We threw them in a big shoebox. Got a young journalism piece out at Emory to take the box of clippings home after about a year and dump it out on his bedroom floor. He and his wife called around in a pile of clippings and sorted them out into five little piles, and it turned out to be the five main ways to be mean in the southern white paper. Then he wrote a smart little pamphlet on, on what was in the little piles. And it was done with wit and with restraint and in good temper and illustration and example. We printed it as a little pamphlet. In it, in big black print, were five rules of what you did about building headlines and using courtesy titles and treating the news impartially and what you did in crime and so on. Then we were very lucky and got the Southern newspaper publishers to send that out to all their papers. Then we were able to get local committees of people, very large of church women, to go and call on the editor and talk to him about what was in the little book. I won't go further, but you can see that that could clean them up paper by paper, and it has done so as to a large proportion of the papers of the side. So here you've had a specific effect from your activity. Well, you never can know how much one little organization does on one of these things, but three years ago, most of the papers were careless, and now most of them are careful. Well, uh, in what other fields uh, like that have you operated, Dr. Mitchell? 
Well, I'll give you another one. Notoriously, the police are a problem in all matters of race relations. A colored guy on the street is accused of some crime. A white policeman comes up. Immediately, that's an interracial incident. And other colored people are a little inclined to say, there's that poor colored man being beaten up by that big white cop and ain't that bad. And it's admitted that our police have not been too well paid, nor in many instances too well trained, nor too careful of everybody's rights. What could you do about that? Well, we talked to all the guys that know about criminology and police administration, and we wrote another little booklet called Race and Law Enforcement, How the Police Ought to Behave. Then we got our friends in each state to send that to every sheriff in every county, to every chief of police. Then again, we got to church women to go in little committees of three and four and call on the sheriff, book in hand, and talk to him about getting the police and his deputies to swing around to this way of behaving in that county. I'll give you one little story out of that. In a county in a deep southern state in the south end of that county, I won't name it, the three church ladies went and called on their sheriff and wrote back in to us, Dear Mrs. So-and-so, we took the little blue book to our sheriff, and the sheriff said everything is all right. He is nice to color, and all his deputies are nice to color. But could you send us one more copy of that little blue book? We want to give it to the night watchman in the jail. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I wonder about this. In what you're doing, do you encounter resentments? Do you have opposition? Do you have trouble? Some, but not much. I mean, you can do things here, but if you're polite, all you got to do is be courteous and truthful, honest, and people respect that, and they they want to do better, and they will if they're decent about it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the people in power are decent people, too. They just want a little time and a little more knowledge and enough courtesy, and we can work it out. We'll work it out, he said. That was a recurring theme. We heard it often in a lounge car threading its way through the smoke-dimmed outskirts of Birmingham in a businessman's club just outside Atlanta. A Negro dock worker used almost these same words one hot afternoon as he paused in his work to wipe his brow and talk for a moment with these inquisitive fellows. We'll work it out. It's a compact with the past, a challenge to those who will come after. Listen to this voice, George Buchanan, editor of the Columbia Record in Columbia, South Carolina. I believe that the racial problem in uh, the South and the racial problem uh, in South Carolina in particular uh, is nearer a solution today than it has been in many years. The what the Negroes call gradualism uh, is of course uh, an attempt by the whites and by the Negroes to educate the people of the state in sound racial relations in granting fairness uh, and fair treatment to uh, uh, persons of all races. The uh, whole problem of uh, racial relations has been an up and down process. I think we have made and are making uh, very considerable progress uh, throughout the South in better uh, racial relations generally. And here's a voice rich with the music of his people. Emory Jackson, Negro editor of the Birmingham World. Listen, here is the past and the future. Uh, well, in some of the newer industries which are coming uh, into the South, you have a few uh, Negroes who are being given better jobs. One of the things is the matter of training uh, for these new jobs which are opening up. And it may be that when they get more training uh, that they will be able to step into some of these newer occupations. Others have heard that phrase, that promise. Let's sit for a moment in the back row of this Negro school. A late afternoon sun splashes across gaily colored dresses and the uniform blue shirts of the boys. It's almost time for the final bill. Already, the lucky ones near the windows are marking the scrawling shadows, counting the hours of sunlight left in this day. But wait, what's this? One of the boys is on his feet, 
He's talking of the future, his future. Uh, one of the changes that has been made in the South for the Negroes in the last 15 years are the building of more schools to try to equalize education among the races. Um, when I finish high school, plan to go to college, I want to be a lawyer. I think that if we all could get together in the South and learn to cooperate with each other and try to stop segregation, that would we, it would be better in the South and no one would have to be afraid of anything that would happen. School will be out in a moment, and already they have forgotten. Mark the sun, young people. Count the time for your hundred plans. Time seems short. You're young. You've not learned what we have learned. There's always tomorrow. came this change that we have marked over the land? What was the compelling force that stirred into life this new world renaissance? We brought that question to Dr. Rex Winslow of Chapel Hill. Why, I asked, why has it happened this way just now? Well, it hasn't gotten that way just now. It has uh, gotten that way through a period of time, but the change has uh, been stirred up by such uh, uh, shaking events as the Great Depression and two world wars, which upset old ways of doing things and old ways of thinking. The change once started uh, tends to be cumulative. But uh, there must have been some other natural or physical handicaps that the old South uh, had on its back uh, that prevented it from coming to this new era more quickly. That is true. The South carried over after the Civil War a bankrupt economy and a bankrupt point of view. Much of the South continued to operate what was, in effect, a peonage system in which the land was owned by relatively few families and a great many people without property worked that land. Uh, under this system, there was no incentive to do two things which is necessary in any prosperous society. Uh, you've got to have an incentive that will make the worker put out. And you've got to have an incentive which will make the, the owner and the enterpriser accumulate and save capital to reinvest in better tools and uh, production techniques. Uh, there was no incentive for the tenant farmer and the renter to produce more since the landlord got it all. So he inclined to be uh, let the soil wear out and inclined to be shiftless and uh, not uh, economically ambitious. He uh, raised the big families of kids to tend the crops, and these kids could not afford to go to school. They were needed to work. So they grew up to perpetuate the system. On the other hand, the families who owned the land uh, had not much incentive to save and invest. They uh, used the surplus to live a very gracious and hospitable life, as contrasted with the behavior of the owning class in New England, where frugality and industry were virtues. Therefore, you have a sociology which, as long as it persisted, tended to hold back uh, those uh, elements of productivity, namely worker output and capital accumulation, which are characteristic of other sections of the United States. As a newspaper man, it was only natural, I suppose, that sooner or later I should turn to a fellow craftsman Bill Workman, news analyst, editor of station WIS in Columbia, South Carolina. Bill, how did it all begin? Well, the big thing in industry that impresses us who are kind of growing with this picture, Henry, is this fact that industry, like agriculture, is becoming diversified. It means, uh, in a number of respects, it means increased income. Uh, in the textile field, there are uh, only so much money to be made in the average run of jobs. You become a 
a doffer or a weaver or whatever you, your specialty may be. You're in that. You become good and you draw good wages. But uh, in the more technical uh, fields, uh, synthetics and so on, the pay is higher. And the, the people uh, prosper accordingly. But we felt that perhaps there was something more, some missing ingredient, too subtle to be charted or measured, a thing without dimensions or form or shape. Once again, we found ourselves in the pleasant book lined study of Paul Green. Mr. Green, why this revolution now and here? Well, um, it's almost the same sort of question on a farmer in a drought. It won't rain. It just won't rain. He looks at his crops burning up, and he gets up at night to see if there's any lightning in the sky, any sound or sign of coming, what he calls falling weather. One morning he'll get up, and the air feels different. He doesn't know why, but it feels different. And along about noon or slightly after noon, he'll see these dark little clouds in the west, and then a little later, the clouds will thicken, and soon you'll hear a roar and rumble of thunder down under the western earth. And you'll shiver, and the crops will shiver, and the trees will shiver, because they sense the coming of rain. Now, why did it rain? The times were right for rain. Yes, there is a new music over the land. Listen to this. It's like the beat of a heart, the pounding of a pulse. But there's melody there, too, if you will listen. What are they making, steel? Is this how coal is mined or how they are freezing food, trapping flavor and nourishment in icy temperatures? It doesn't matter. It's all there. You can see the pins on the map. A new factory where six years ago there was a sleepy, time-haunted village. New ways to grow food. Better methods of raising cattle. New, bigger, better. The words repeat like the refrain of a song. Speed it up. This is a time to build. Of course, some of the old survives. The ancient pride is still there, the love of land that Jefferson knew and Patrick Henry and the others. Not in a few years or a decade, nor yet a generation, does one wipe out the past. But I have seen a revolution in economy, in industry, in agriculture, in living. It's a proud thing, conceived in sunlight and born of courage and of hope. A revolution contrived not of anger nor of hate, but of pride and vision. This, then, is the new self. The promise and the fulfillment, the future rising from the ashes of the old. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to break down and a time to build. been listening to A Time to Build, the first in a series of 13 programs entitled Heritage Over the Land, based on the developments in the American South. Our field reporter has been Arthur Hepner. This program was written and directed by William Allen Bales, produced by Miss Lee F. Payton. These reports on the New South are the first in a series done in cooperation with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. It is planned that other programs will deal with the remarkable growth and changes in other sections of America. Next week at this time, we will bring you the second of the series, a story of the new changes that have come to those who farm the lands that once were thrall to cotton.
Thank you.